Oh, uh, hey, just one second. I can get I can get a couple of the scripts so you can look at the storyboards. Hang on. You're right. This is a bound script of Lonesome Dove. It's, you'll, you'll, it, it, it'll, it'll have, um, I'll, f- I'll find a couple of pages with storyboards, stuff like that, see? And I think that's, that's for the opening sequence, the roundup at night time. Look, I, me- I remember it very, very clearly. Um, his name came up because he went to film school with a wonderful uh, director called John Melius. He did a score for a film called Farewell to the King, uh, which is a movie that John Melius did, and the score was terrific. And our producer, Dyson Lovell, uh, he said, gee, this is the man that's got the big sort of feel for an epic like Lonesome Dove. So we... <clears throat> we met with Basil and um, he loved, everybody loved the material because the book was very famous. It had won the Pulitzer Prize. And um, so uh, <clears throat> we decided on the strength of uh, Farewell to the King, we used some of that music a- as temporary music when we first screened the rough cut to the CBS network. And they said they really liked it. So that was the start, really. And uh, so I remember my first get-together with Basil. It was a Sunday afternoon, and uh, he lived in a place called El C- in Encino in the, in the valley in Los Angeles. And um, we had basically four 90-minute movies to score, and we didn't have a huge amount of money. So what we had to do was we had to go through each movie. Of, here they are. There's the, the four scripts, if you like. And um, and we had to um, work out where we'd like to use the A orchestra, that was the big orchestra, then the smaller orchestra, the B orchestra, then the much smaller orchestra, the C orchestra, and then the D orchestra, which is a very, very – and and we went through the whole <coughs> of the four uh, movies and basically worked out which orchestra and which required a big score and which could be small and, and which type of music suited which character, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how it all began, you know. And that probably – because when you score a movie, you, you, you the composer doesn't really get involved until he sees the, 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 the fine cut of the movie, until it's basically what we call locked when all the picture changes are made and the producers are happy and the network's happy and then the sound people come in and the composer comes in. And what the director and the composer do, they sit down and they what we call spot the music. They decide where the music's going to start, where it's going to finish, and and they talk about the feeling they want to get out of each music cue that they're trying to achieve. And then what happens in Basil's case That was before the days of uh, um, uh, electronic soundtracks and synthesizers and all that. So Basil would (coughs) rough the score out on a theme out on piano and then play it to me and say, this is what I'm thinking for the the main theme and Clara's theme and so forth. And you go from there, basically. And that's sort of how we did it. And uh, with Basil... The score never, the melody, the theme never came easily. It would always come, if he had a six-week deadline, it probably wouldn't come until the fifth week. And he would then work day and night and everything would come out in a rush, you know. And I remember on Lonesome Dove, our second last scoring session with the big orchestra, he went home and wrote another 20 minutes of music for the next day, you know. But by then he had all his themes, so he knew what he was trying to achieve with it. It was just, and then he would quickly flesh it out and give it to his orchestrator who was helping him get through the giant workload because it was a massive undertaking, you know. I guess the producer, the director composer relationship varies from composer to composer, but most most of directors are very close to their composers, and that's the nitty gritty, if you like. And um, um, but in in the case of a lot of producers, 
once you come up with the themes, they like to hear them before, and I'll tell you the story about Free Willy later on. Yeah, no, so basically Basil would uh, uh, play it to me on the piano and say, oh, this is where the brass comes in and this is where the timps come in. And, and, but um, it's, it's really hard to imagine that these days what happens, the, compu- the, the, the composer lays it all out uh, electronically and uh, and so you get you get a full treatment if you like that sounds very close to the orchestral version. It doesn't have quite have the emotion, but um, and that's become a very important part of. Uh, 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 whereas in Lonesome Dove's time, that hadn't come into being yet, you know, or oh, only only just, you know, and uh, and Basil certainly wasn't at it at this stage, you know. The type of music that he had written for other movies, you know that it's going to it's going to work, you know. And so, the, of course, the most wonderful moment is the first time you hear it in the recording studio. You just go, "Wow!" You know, it, when it works. And uh, and with Basil, it always worked. But I've been with some composers where it, 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 it's not quite as exciting as that, you know. And you ask them to redo something, but with Basil, never. It was always so spot on, you know. He just he just felt for the material, and as I said, it took a long time for him to get the, the melody for the theme, but then it would just all come out in a rush. He was fantastic like that. You know, he agonised over the themes until he was really happy with them, and then away he'd go, you know. The wonderful thing about Basil's score for Quigley is that it has a kind of a, a sense of fun because the character ha- always, Tom Selleck, ha- sort of a twinkle in the eye, if you know what I mean, and uh, and Basil's score had that kind of bit of um, whimsy, if you like, you know, and um, and uh, it was a, it was a very dramatic score, and uh, and he particularly when the with the involvement of the Aborigines, the indigenous uh, you know uh, population, and. Uh, he was able to underline it with some nice uh, didgeridoos and local sort of colour, which made it which made it great. But uh, it was also we had a nice big budget for that film, so he wasn't so restricted by the size of the orchestra. When he needed a big orchestra, he could he could have it. And uh, I remember the head of the studio was Alan Ladd Jr. and uh, he just loved Basil's score for that movie. Laddie, uh, he uh, he uh, was uh, head of the studio at the time, which was Pathé, and uh, and I remember playing him the first, very first cue after we'd recorded. He just loved it, you know. Mainly leave it up to him, but usually I'd have him read the script and just say, "I'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas," and and we'd talk about it, and then really. He did. We he never really got involved until the film was the editing was finished, you know, and uh, and then we would come in and first of all I'd show him the film, and then we'd look at it again and we'd as I told you before we'd spot the music. I want the music to start here. What do you think? And tail off here. We'll go across here, and you know, <clears throat> and that's pretty much after we'd spot the film. Then he'd just really go away and start playing with ideas and themes, and uh, and then he'd come back and <clears throat> play uh, play them on the piano. But then, as the years went by, he then started to lay it out on a computer, and uh, you'd be able to hear a mock-up orchestra playing, and uh, uh, and that made it a lot easier for everyone to get what he was trying to achieve, you know. But um, we. Uh, I pretty much left him pretty free, you know, because, you know, composers are great at, <clears throat> they quite often have a different take on a scene that's very exciting, you know, and they think, oh, I don't think I'll use a big orchestra here. I might just use a haunting piano theme or something like that, you know, and uh, uh, and so I, Baz was wonderful because he, he, he loved movies and he went to, you know, he went to, um, to uh, film school at USC, and he was in a very famous class that had a lot of other famous people: um, George Lucas, John Milius, uh, Randall Kleiser, um, 
uh, Matthew Robbins, da da da. It just goes on. It was an amazing group of uh, uh, the, this famous year at USC, and Basil was part of that. And uh, in fact, B Basil's first project was not as a composer. He was actually directed a film that John Melius was going to do because they thought John Melius was too mad to do it. So they said, Basil, you're going to do it. <laughs> this is at film school, you know. <laughs> but no, he was first and foremost a composer, obviously, but he loved films and he was very loyal too. That's what was wonderful about Basil. For example, when we were doing Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, he chose to do that movie over Kevin Costner really wanted him to do Dances with Wolves. And he turned that down to do Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man because I I'd asked him to do it and he committed to it. And I would have understood if he wanted to pull out, but Basil being very loyal, he said, no, no, I want to do this movie with Simon. And uh, so that's a mark of his uh, uh, loyalty, if you like, and uh, and that was what's so wonderful about him. And, for example, later on you asked the question, what happened when Basil didn't do all those movies? It wasn't because I didn't want him to. He wasn't available. He was tied up on other movies. So, for example, on Operation Dumbo Drop and on The Phantom, uh, he suggested to me, oh, well, you try David Newman. You'll really like working with David, you know. Basil recommended him because he was tied up doing, I can't remember at the time what it was, but he just wasn't available. And that is quite often what happens, you know. And, uh, and they were both quite good friends, you know. David's another very good friend of mine and a wonderful composer, and his brother is Thomas Newman too, who's another extraordinary composer. You know? I guess uh, Basil <laughs> loved rock, all that sort of style of music, and uh, and... He, you know, Harley, um, he, he just, you know, a different approach because it's a, it's a different kind of movie, I guess. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a buddy movie, if you like. And, uh, and um, yeah, it was a nice change of pace because he was used to doing these big orchestral kind of movies and, and it was, he felt it was a real change of pace to do something that was a bit different, you know. I guess that's a sign of a good composer. I mean, you look at someone like John Williams and, Every score he does is different. And he, again, Jerry Goldsmith, like Basil, he did such a variety of different scores, you know, that he did a, a, one of my favourite Jerry Goldsmith scores is a film called The Wind and the Lion. And that was the same with Basil. It's never the same, you know. And, uh, and uh, it, it's always a slightly different approach and the melodies are all terrific and, uh, and uh you know, it's never it's never heavy-handed, you know, and uh, but he knows when to push all the right buttons. I mean, there's a couple of cues in Lonesome Dove, and I, I had not looked at it for many, many years, and I looked at a new widescreen version recently, and in part three, there's a scene where uh, Gus, played by uh, Robert Duval, leaves Clara and Lorena and rides off sort of to go north to Montana. And the two girls, the former love of his life and the one that really loves him, Lorena, that he's rescued, they stand there as he says goodbye and rides away. And the music there just sends a shiver up your spine. It is so big and so wonderful and so moving. And they're the moments a director always looks for in a film when you know, the combined effect of, you know, character and sound and music and cinematography combined to send a shiver up your spine. And that's what Basil was so good at doing. You know? I, I just I just love the man. He was just so wonderful to work with. And uh, he always delivered. And I never heard anyone complain that they didn't like his music, you know. Basil and I had that in common because I grew up in Sydney. And and I grew up on next to Sid, uh, Sydney Harbour, and so my whole life was surfing and sailing. And now Basil loved surfing. He did a film with John Milius called Big Wednesday, a big surfing movie, you know. And uh, and uh, he told some wonderful stories about that, how frightened they got when they went out for the big waves and couldn't get back in. And uh, but Basil loved the sea. He had a wonderful sailing boat, and and uh, he and I would spend a lot of time sailing on his boat on the, on the weekends and 
in fact, the last day I spent with Basil, only a couple of weeks before he passed away, we <clears throat> had breakfast together and then we drove in his runabout across to Catalina Island where his yacht was moored. We spent the day on his yacht and then he dropped me back and I caught the ferry back to Los Angeles and that was only about two weeks before he passed away. He was very ill then with cancer. But uh, um, he just loved the sea, he loved sailing, and he loved the ocean. You're absolutely right. And that's very much reflected um, in his work, particularly the movie Wind. Um, and that, that score I, I thought was wonderful. And, uh, and um, I mentioned that too because that's, Warner Brothers did not like the idea of Basil Polidurus for Free Willy. Um, they wanted... They said, oh, Basil Polidurus writes too militaristic music, you know, because he'd done all the, you know, like Rogo, Robocop. And, that, and so I, I, as a temp score, I used all the music from wind. And, uh, and then when we tested Free Willy, it was the highest test film Warner Brothers had ever had. It scored 98 in its preview test, you know. And uh, after that, Warner Brothers let us do whatever we wanted and I got Basil, you know. And, uh, and the music budget went from, I don't know, 100,000 to about 350,000. We had huge orchestras and, and Basil did a beautiful score for Free Willy, you know. He just really, to me, nailed that film. It was such an emotional film and such a popular and successful film and his score had, was such a, an important part of that movie. Um, there's a funny story about Free Willy. I was working on a series about young Indiana Jones, and uh, and uh, we were filming in uh, in, and I was scouting in Turkey, and uh, in the middle of the night, the phone rings, and it was Richard Donner. He said, "Basil's just played me on the piano the theme for Three Willy. It's a waltz, kid. It's a waltz. What do we want with a waltz? You know?" And I said, <clears throat> "He said it can't be a goddamn waltz. You know." He called everybody kid. You know, and uh, and I said. Dick, just please, just wait until you hear it orchestrated with an orchestra. You've just heard it on the piano. I said, it will reduce you to tears, the whole opening cue, which is about five or six minutes, you know. So cut to a, a couple of months later and the very first recording day, at Hen, there we are on a big old MGM scoring stage at Sony Pictures, 110 in the orchestra, and they play the first cue. And we took all morning to rehearse it. And just before the lunchtime, they recorded it. And just at that moment, Richard Donner walked into the, the recording, you know, the, the, the control room. And they started, you know, and this theme played. And it was huge and beautiful and the capture of the whale and all this sort of stuff. And at the very end, I looked around and he's got tears running down his face. <laughs> I said, you, you didn't like the walls, but there it was, Dick, you know. Uh, so <clears throat> he was a wonderful guy, a love, and a very talented, wonderful director, you know, um, and, and a fun producer, but he could not understand it on the piano that it was a waltz, that whole opening thing, you know. Uh, it, it's a waltz, you know, and it starts out just with a synthesizer, ring, ding, da, da, and then builds up and then the whale comes out of the water and in comes the orchestra. It's fantastic, you know. And uh, uh, bless Dick's heart, he, uh, he wore his heart on his sleeve and he gave me the big thumbs up, you know. And, and obviously Basil's love for the ocean is reflected very much in that, in that movie. But, boy, did I have to fight hard for him initially. Boy, oh, boy. I met them on the very first day when we laid out in his living room floor and worked out all the different orchestras. He had two lovely daughters and his wife, uh, Bobby. They're a very close family and, um, and they became very firm friends of my family and, uh, and, and my kids too and uh, stuff like that. They were, they were great. Yeah. Bobby, she quite often organised, you know, the, a lot of the logistics of the recording, you know, the orchestra and the contractor and stuff like that. So Basil could concentrate purely on the creative side, you know, because the logistics of a big score like this where we probably had uh, nine or ten at least, if not more, recording sessions, you know, we would have had 
about four with the big orchestra, about another four with the medium orchestra, and then lots with the smaller orchestras, you know. And uh, and it it just goes on and on and on and on. And by the time Basil finished the last theme, we had actually we were doing the final uh, mix for the film, and uh, we got Basil's last cue literally when we arrived at that point in the film, you know, he'd just, they'd just put it together and mixed it down and everything and it arrived at the recording studio where we were doing the final dub, you know. That's how close to <laughs> our deadline it was. But it was always wonderful and uh, because the last episode orchestrally is probably the biggest one of the whole um, four episodes and, uh, and uh, there was a lot of big orchestral stuff in that. And that required a lot of work, you know. Basil's family were very his his wife was very involved in and as I said earlier, and um he always con conducted uh the, the every cue himself. He always conducted his own stuff. Sometimes he played the piano, but uh, on the recording session if it was something very special. Um but uh because he he was a very good pianist and um but his piano at home, because Basil was a smoker, they were all cigarette burns by the keyboard, you know, where he'd be, forget that there was a cigarette burning there and be so involved in, you know, writing the music, he'd forget, oh, my cigarette, you know, so there's all little burns along the piano. <laughs> I remember driving with Basil up to Paul Hogan's place in Santa Barbara uh, to to introduce Basil to Paul and uh, and Paul was a great fan of his work and uh, we talked about because Paul was a producer on the movie as well and he created the original and uh, and uh, they really hit it off too you know um, and uh, uh, the three of us talked about what we wanted for Crocodile Dundee you know a sense of fun and whimsy and uh, and Australia and uh, all that sort of stuff and. Uh, I really like the opening theme of that, the sort of when you're introduced to the outback in Australia, I think it's a wonderful driving sort of thing that Basil did, you know, with didgeridoo, you know, that's that Aboriginal uh, big long tube that they play and uh, it's, it's wonderful, yeah. Basil worked himself too hard, you know, and uh, he's survived on coffee and cigarettes, you know. He's very undisciplined, a wonderful human being. And he really, his health was starting to, uh, you know, catch up with him uh, then. And uh, and um, uh, so he slowed down a lot. And he introduced me to a young composer that had been helping him with all the uh, synthesizer and computer stuff called Eric Colvin. And uh, and uh, he he Eric did a couple of wonderful TV movies for me that uh, Basil said he just wasn't up to doing because uh, you know he he was busy with other things and uh, and uh, so that was wonderful but and Eric he reflected so much of Basil's work he was and still is wonderful you know but never quite reached the heights yet of Basil but. Um, uh, uh, I still used to see a lot of Basil because we were very good friends and we'd go down and sit on his boat and I'd call into his studio because it was uh, it was near where we lived in Santa Monica and, uh, and um, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, he, he was around. But sadly, when he got sick, he, uh, he was very, very up and down because I wanted him to do, in 2006, I did the prequel to Lonesome Dove, which is called Comanche Moon, and I wanted Basil to do the score, but he just health-wise just wasn't up to it, um, and uh, which was a great pity. But um, uh, uh, he just uh, he he you know he he ran down he just his health ran down sadly, and uh, and um, just I think worked too hard and. Uh, uh, um, just, I just remember him as a, um, a, a wonderfully understanding human being. You know, he always seemed to be able to, but he agonised 
over every single note of music that he wrote. And uh, even on Free Willy, I can remember, you know, day and night, day and night, oh, I think I've got a theme, you know, and, and uh, but he would agonise over it and, uh, and then out it would come, you know. I think probably on the last recording of Lonesome Dove, and we were had caught up to him in the final mix of the show, and he the second it was the second last recording session. It was night time, and he put down all these wonderful cues for for night for nightfall for the fourth movie. And he turned around and said, I've got to go home and write the last 24 minute, mi minutes of music. And I went, oh, my God, I couldn't believe that he, he could get that much done and, uh, uh, you know, with the amount of stress. And he was also, you know, he was conducting the orchestra and admittedly some of those cues he wasn't orchestrating himself but and he had his themes, but it's still an incredible amount of music to churn out for the, the last session, you know. And, and that that always stayed with me. He he was he was wonderful like that, just just wonderful. And um, uh, and uh, and the other time Basil would get really excited was when we were out sailing and there was a good wind and the the, the rail of his yacht would tip right over and the water would be coming over and he'd be yelling like a little child. Whoa! You know? <laughs> he loved his sailing and uh, and uh, it was great. You know? A nice release from recording music and writing music, you know. The thing about Basil was that he was very modest. Um, you know, he was he was a tower of strength in in his world, you know, as a composer. But uh, he was just a nice, regular human being, and uh, uh, brilliantly creative, but uh, very, very modest and unassuming and uh, and uh, that's what I'd certainly say about Basil I just adored working with him and he became such a good friend and uh, and um, we, we we were very close which was which is wonderful you know but it's always fun because the music is almost the final stage of the movie when it's finished and it sort of brings it to life it gives it it's, it gives it its pace it gives it its energy and it gives its emotion, and that's what Basil was so good at doing, you know, emotion. You know, you think of Lonesome Dove, you think of uh, oh, Free Willy in particular. It's, it's so emotional, those scores, and, uh, and um, they, uh, they, they just uh, stand the test of time, you know. Um, beautiful orchestrations and, uh, and beautiful... Uh, detail and and depth and that's what's wonderful about his music but you're obviously big fans oh, it's my pleasure thank you merci beaucoup well i see we're coming up to exactly 60 minutes so that's perfect you know 59 19 59 20 there you go <laughs> we're just going out for dinner that's all so